John Donnell, the legend at large. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> no, I've, had I remember, of, I've had a lot of help. <laughs> um, I first knew of you when you were with Flip, Walker's K Chronicle, years and years and years ago when he was calling you Dozer. And you guys fit so well together. And I remember you catching that big old tarpon and jumping into your face and breaking your nose. <laughs> Flip was wonderful. No, he got me started and involved in that show. And it was um, it was a, a real compliment to me for that to happen. And um, And I was, you know, just like a kid, you know, I was trying to, so that was a huge help, and it was so much fun. The, 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 the crew and the whole group involved in that whole series was pretty amazing. Right. And uh, um, God actually got later doing that show with Flip, it actually got to where I really enjoyed the camera boat work, where I'd rather not be on film. So a lot of those shows I got to work as a camera boat because I really, it was just more relaxing. Being right. On, being on, on camera was like nerve-wracking. Was it? But, you no, know, not really, but it was kind of. But you you but, you, you appeared so natural and so oh, normal. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I tried. <laughs> you yeah. did. No, it was awesome. Yeah, but, yeah they had, to, and they were shooting on film too at that time. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's not like they could keep redoing stuff, you know. But no, but thank you. No, it was it was a that was an exciting time for me to do that. That was well, a compliment. You know, it, and I mentioned this before. It was well before I had ever seen a saltwater fish, but the show had resonated so well around the world. I think. Flip and that show brought so many people to this game, you know, and I, every time I see Flip, I say, you know, thank you, Lord, for putting that out there. Um, and he's so poetic. Um, being with Flip, he has such an amazing way with words, but I, I spoke to him the other day about you, uh, about a number of issues, which I hope <laughs> to, <laughs> to touch upon, but I, I asked him, what is John Donnell's best quality? And he said, you are the most reliable person he's ever known. He said, if you need a kidney, John Donnell will jump up on the table and cut his out for you. <laughs> That's exactly what Flip was That's saying. That's exactly, yeah, right? <laughs> wow, wow, that was sweet of him to say that. But would you do that? I would. I know well, I, if I had, I got, you got two of them, right? So yeah, yeah. I'd give him, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, I'd give him a kidney. I don't think anybody would want my kidney. So no, I'd definitely give no, I'd definitely give him a kidney. Well, let's go back a little bit. Tell me about your upbringing. Uh, I grew up in Miami. Miami's home, and I uh, loved to fish as a kid. You know, did you know did some fishing around Miami. My paper out. I always had a spinning rod, you know, and a zero spook, and I'd run around, you know. And but I grew up in Miami, and my dad was in the boating business, yachting business, and um, um, my dad was a big part of it. He put a lot of faith in me on being on the water. He had a Grand Banks dealership, actually in Miami, the first one oh, in wow. the Southeast, yeah. And uh, so I was, um, you know, pretty comfortable on the water. And I loved it. I mean, I loved being on the water and pretty much grew up on it. Um, I, the fishing came later. I was more, you know, more interested in, at, you know, 16 or 17, I had other things on my mind besides right. fishing. So. <laughs> but it was, um, no, it was fun to grow up on the water. My, we, we'd go to the Bahamas every year as a family for a couple of weeks, you know, on a trade-in boat, they would be trade-in or something. But we spent a lot, yeah, it was really special. And uh, especially now looking back on it, I realize how special that was. Well, Flip Ted, you know, he says that you're a child of the outdoors. You're very talented at all of that, hunting God, and canoeing. Oh, he loves you dearly. <laughs> but um, but you either get it or you don't. I mean, Nikki got yeah. it, you know. Sure. Um, a snowboarder, a fisher, you know, a hunter. And either you, you have it or you don't. But I know that, that you guys have done a lot of things together. Um, when did you feel that connection with Flip? Because he and Chico and little John Emery uh, were a tight team. And you mentioned that little John played a role in your life at one point. Uh, uh, very much so. And, and I f felt the connection with Flip immediately. The first time I met him, it just I just felt like i you know known him. Where was Not that? Known. What happened? Where did you meet him? It's funny. I had my shop. I had a store um, in Fort Lauderdale, and it was a fly fishing related store. Anyway, I, I met him and through that connection. I knew a flip, of course. Flip, like you mentioned, a group, you know, John Emery, Flip. Duncan. Um, yeah, Norman Duncan, of course. You know, it was a pretty, pretty major group. And, um, and, uh, and I was excited, you know, to get to know him. So I, when I first met him, 
I invited them. I said, God, you know, I got this spot um, that's all 41 that I'd love to fish. It's really good. I mean, we need to go. If I'd love to take you into it to see it. And he said, God, it, I love the idea of going off 41 and in a canoe and doing some fishing. So, so what was 41? Is that, that a canal? That was Tamami Trail. Okay. Mm. Yeah, Tamami Trail. And uh, so I had actually gone into this area as um, it, when I was in high school with one of my buddies. His father took us in there on a duck shoot. And we uh, had a great t- blue wing shoot on teal. It was really impressive. But I said, God, this is, looks pretty fishy. It was actually a tidal system and it looked right. So I later, I mean, much later, this is going way past high school. Like back when I got back and I went, went down there and, and um, was able to push back into the system. I knew right where it was and was able to take a canoe and push back through the grass. It took about 20 or 30 minutes and then it opened up into this tidal system that was really good. And, and so, what were you fishing for, snook? Snook. It was, yeah. it was primarily snook. There were some little tarpon in two or three spots, but it was little snook everywhere. And not big ones, you know. But, I mean, you'd get – I mean, it wasn't unusual to catch a seven, eight-pounder in there, but a lot of two- to four-pound snook and, and smaller. So it was – but it was pretty cool. I mean, It's amazing how many people got their start at the Tamiami Trail with, with snook fishing, you know, right. talking oh. to Chico and Norman Duncan oh, yeah. and all those guys. They started right there at Tamiami Trail. Yeah, they used to actually get on top of their cars and drive Chico, then drive down at 29 going into Everglades City and sight cast to these great big snook. I mean, you know, like bruisers. You know, they'd see them. You know, they'd see them and actually, you know, sight with fly rods. Fly, you know, so cool. With Chico with his with his cane rods back then. Yeah. <laughs> what but, the- I, I, but with Flip, I so I invited him um, to um, – is that my phone? D- don't worry about it. Okay. It's all good. All right, okay. <laughs> um, um, so I invited him and said, yeah, yeah. He goes, let's go, man. So I said, so I, you know, I had it down now. I had I actually had a little bit of a trail going in. So I took him in there. I'd never fished. I'd never fished with him forever. I just met him. And um, so we get in there, and I say, okay, man. So he was bait cast. And so I said, well, here, you got to use a 7 in mirror lure. I said, that's that's a done deal. I mean, just red and white 7 in mirror lure, everything eats it. And uh, he was like, you know, not really responding. I saw him tying something on, and so he puts he puts on a bucktail. I go, jeez, I mean, you know, really bucktail, really. I mean, you know, within thirty minutes, I had a bucktail on. I mean, he was. I mean, it was ridiculous. I mean, you know how good he is with the bucktail for sure. Right? He's like, like, and um, it was, was, was pretty... that was that when the light went off for you as a fly fisherman, possibly. Oh, and uh, well, going into it, well, no, the bucktail was on a baitcaster. It was a three eight oh. ounce Millie's. No, oh no, no. The the I'll tell you the fly fishing part in a, in a second. No, that was a three eight ounce, you know, Millie's bucktail jig. Okay, you know, I was telling him to use a plug because it was shallow system back then. I sure. said you should use a plug, and he goes and he goes. I keep all those hooks, and you know, they drive me crazy. And I just, and but he just, it was ridiculous. He caught so many snook, and I, so he, I totally became a jig fisherman. I mean, big time after that day. It was funny. We were laughing about it this morning. I called him up. I was trying to remember what our first trip was. He reminded me of the day we pushed a canoe back in there, and he refused to put on a mirror lure. So that's what I said. So, what, so he gave you that great compliment. What would be the best term that you could use to represent who Flip is as your friend? The best term is just God dependable. I mean, uh, the best term, I mean, he's just, he's flip, you know. Um, that's a tough one, Andy. I'd have to think about that. For There's so many terms I want to come up with. But he came and, and it, rescued you on at least one occasion, I know. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, of course. Yeah, no, I think we've rescued each other a few times. Yeah. We'll Which get, occasion was that? Maybe when they uh, ran out of fuel or something. Oh, yeah, okay. With the big bird in the sky. Yeah, that was... Uh, we can get into that a little bit later. Yeah, yeah but, okay. But, um, you know, but you guys go, see, like, what kind of a relationship do you have with them at this point? Oh, very close. No, no, we're, we're super tight. We really, literally, I really would give him a kidney on a, get on a kitchen table and cut one out if he needed it. Yeah. No, I know. We're real super tight. He's uh, um, he's helped develop my um, me a lot as far as helping me in every possible way you can in so many situations. Especially when I came back, well, starting, you know, when I was in Fort Lauderdale after I came back. Um, and uh, he uh, he's always been real 
he's given me a lot of confidence, you know, and he's always been extremely, yeah. um, just extremely grateful. I'm extremely grateful for what he's done. I That's a hard one. I wish I could just come up with all the right well, words. Well, there's just so many words to represent how you feel, you yeah. know, for sure. Yeah, I know it's it's a lot. He's he's pretty he's very special. You know what? It's a it's a um a pretty tight group down here and it's a pretty and back then it was in a pretty amazing um situation we had going on as far as the fishery the, the I just it, there was it was pretty comp there's a lot going on it was a pretty complex whether you wanted the snook permit but there's a lot of areas i mean south florida was like on there's fire no, nowhere like it i mean there's really nowhere else like it what, what year are you speaking i'm of? talking 75 75 70, i'm absolutely talking uh because i first met flip probably 75 or 76 right so i'm talking about the 70s early 80s it was a pretty crazy place when did you get down into the keys and start fishing florida bay in this area i started fishing in the 80s i was coming down uh-huh. there and renting a house you know tarpon fishing we i'd come down with bob random We'd rent a house, Bob Branham, Jerry Gehring, myself, Kenny Collett. We'd rent a house and we'd be here for eight, May and June. Everybody hated us because we, <laughs> we were from <laughs> out Miami. Out of town. Yeah, out of Miami, yeah. Did so, you have your tires slashed? No, no, never had any tires slashed. Thank yeah, God. You know, no, that was, I appreciate it. But that. There, was a, there was an era or a time when a lot of the locals were really trying to like keep everybody abreast. Oh, yeah. But there weren't, when we started, you know, there weren't that many. I mean, you you could really almost a tarp. When I started tarp and fly fishing here, probably in the eighty in nineteen eighty, or late seventies, before I had my captain's license, I got my captain's license in nineteen eighty. But you know, they're looking at it now. I guess maybe I'm just looking at it in relationship to what it used to be. But it was pretty, and and those guys were pretty solid. I mean, all the old guys, the all the old Alamorada guides. You know, even the tough ones, they were, you know, they may not talk to you and they may not like you, but, you know, they put up with us, you know, you know, so it was pretty. How uh, long did it take for them to warm up to you guys being down here? Um, A lot of them never. Like who? You know, like, well, I who is the coldest? Name. Now, I, throw it out there. Give me uh, one name. Uh, God, I, one of the toughest ones I had to deal with was probably, um, Oh, what's his name? My God, I can't think of it right now. Um, oh, oh, God, I know. Um, geez, he was crusty. Um, <laughs> what well, about- let me let me start. The, the The easy ones were Billy Knowles was was really always nice. Hank Brown was a little tough. Hank wasn't that easy. Um, was Cecil re- Keith still around? Oh yeah, time? Cecil. Cecil just didn't talk to you. I mean, he wasn't mean, he wasn't rude, he wouldn't cut you off. If you were somewhere you needed to be, he would not get right in front of you like this other guy did all the time. Cecil was respectful, but he would never talk to you. Right. He would never say hi or would never say, hey, you know, how's your fishing today? Or he just totally would, you know, ignore you. Cecil was, you know, that's <laughs> what, which was okay, you know, but he was, uh, um, you know, we were scared of Cecil. You know, I was... Scared Jimmy Albright. I fished Jimmy Albright's wife, Kathy, in the women's tournament for like seven or eight years. So I got a in with Kathy and or with Jimmy because I fished with his wife right. for quite a while, which was a real compliment to me. Actually, by that happening, um, really opened up some other of the older guides here to me because I was you know fishing with Kathy and she was pretty, you know, she was running a green turtle restaurant at the time and. And that was a big help. Actually, that was, I'm glad you brought that up because I'd forgotten that. That was a big, big help for me. For Jimmy to ask me to fish Kathy yeah, that's and it is a huge compliment. Right. I, mean, I couldn't believe it, actually, when he asked me. So that was a, actually, that was, a, that's, thanks for my, that was really a big help. So. Well, who were the guys that you, that were your mentors um, that were from down here, if anyone? No, uh, John Emery, huge. John was really probably one of my biggest, biggest um, heroes. I mean, and really helped me a lot. And he was respected tremendously by a lot of people. He was a good. When, f- when you say he, he helped you out, you're talking about like spots and tides and 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 also uh, um, tots and spots and tides, but also um, just in his faith in me, like you know, giving me charters. Believe, you know, yeah, help me in, in every way you could. I mean, being a good friend, actually. 
you know, and then actually believing, you know, just giving me confidence, you know, so. Did you have anyone that helped you out with the fishery or did you do all your exploring by yourself and figure it out on your own? No, no, I had help. I can't even, of course I did. I had help from Flip because Flip knew this area as good right. as anybody. Probably um, one of the huge helps I had was Ted Jurassic. Yeah, Ted really taught me, you know, Everglades Park. You know, he really truly did. This is way back when he was... You know, he was basically um, fishing all back up in Hell's Bay with Herman Lucerne. And, and you know, and Ted showed me, he's take his time to show me how to get in. He says, John, always go into Hell's Bay this way and then run around do all you want and always come out this way. He had a way in and right. a way out. He never, and um, he just like, ingra- it got ingrained in my, you know. So Ted was actually probably one of my biggest helpers. Was Ted it, it, it's so overwhelming when you take a look at, Florida yep. Bay and Alamorada yep. and, and, and Whitewater Bay on a map. Right. And you're not immersed in that environment, which you were. You were. But if you you weren't, and you take a look at yeah. it on the map, you get overwhelmed. You're like, where do I fish? fish? Yes. Yeah. And it was still like that till just to tell the GPS has really got good. You know, now they can lay a track and it doesn't matter. They can just go anywhere right. and they can get home. You know, they can just run their track home. So that's kind of a – back then, you know, it was really – you just you knew you weren't going to see anybody in, in there. I mean, there was no way, you know. So it's pretty neat. Um, but yeah, no. Ted Jurassic was huge. John Emery was huge. You know, the other guys put up with me, and uh, the tarpon thing I kind of figured out. You know, um, you know, I just you know figured it out kind of on my own and, and with friends. You know, right. I didn't have a lot of people saying, "God, you really should go here or go there." You know, a lot they weren't real happy to see us. Right. You know, when I first started guiding, you know. What did Florida Bay look like when you first started fishing back in it was, the eighties? Well, it was beautiful. There was, I mean, obviously, it was much healthier. I mean, there's big like the area, like First National Bank, was solid turtle grass. Right. First National was beautiful. One of my favorite tarpon spots back then. And the way. Sandy Key Basin, all the fish were in there. Sandy Key Basin. That pattern was as reliable. That was probably one of the most reliable tarpon spots, you know, in May and June. What would you the, see when you'd run out there first thing in the morning if you wanted to fish Sandy Key Basin? You'd see tarpon roll. I mean, on a morning if you were there early and the first one there maybe, um, and the tides were flooding, you, you had a good rise in tide, you'd just see tarpon rolling everywhere. I mean, you'd see, I mean, they were just so all over. So it was not the, that hard. They were all over the place. Oh, yeah, well, there's a, no, there was a real strict regime in Sandy Key Basin. That was one of the, t- I mean, you better be at the stake if you're in the first spot. And oh, so the, you there? It was a lineup. Oh God! Oh, huge! Oh my God! Yeah, no. If you were out of line, I mean, you know, they would let you know about it. And so, if you came in there and there's a couple boats there, you had to really be careful to get into the third spot, you know, which was getting closer to Rocky Channel. But no, you had to be really gentle. I mean, incredibly gentle pull to get in. Pull quietly. There. Yeah, pull for miles, you know, to try to get in there. You could not run in there. Right. You know, so you really had to be, uh, you could run if the water was up enough, you could maybe run up way behind them. But, you know, then you're running up on a flat, which was not right. a good thing to do. But, you know, Billy, you know, the guys in the, if you were in the pocket, not in the pocket, in, um, at the stake, you know, the first spot, you know. Um, uh, oh, another, you know, I'm sorry. There's a couple of names I just want to throw out throw right it, now, yeah, and, but sure. I can't think of them. I That's, just know they're older guys, and I'm just and with the pressure of having to think of them. I could think, <laughs> no, I could think of them if I could just because there was somebody else I wanted to mention. God, it's driving me nuts. I know. I'll think of I, it in I, a minute. I experience that every day. Yeah, no, I and I'm experiencing it right now because there are just a couple of people I would love to right. say that I really you know respected and had to be real careful. You know that I was very gentle, and yeah. I mean say I mean really very gentle and respectful. You know, trying to fish with them if they were somewhere, and I knew that I was allowed to get behind them. I knew right. that, but sometimes getting behind them, you had to be pretty, pretty careful. Has, I mean, over- has, has that respect gone away a little bit now? And uh, two, you know, two thousand twenty-one. It was simpler back then because you know there was a pretty known group. Um, there's a lot of guides now, so probably, yeah, probably has. But no, the guides t- today still the young guides I know. There's a handful of them incredibly respectful they're right. really they're actually you know will come in and say john do you mind if i get behind you or 
And I'll say, God, guys, thank you. And, you know, I said, really, right. thank you for asking, but of course not. No, jump back there and you know where to get, right? And they say, well, yeah, you know, if they're not in the right spot, I'll try to gently say, hey, you know, you really need to be kind of- Good for you. Kind of here. So no, it's it's been a pleasure. It's been fun seeing the younger guys, but I, I feel sorry. Um, I really feel sorry for them that they didn't get to see what I saw, you know? And what they're seeing is they're good fishermen and they're just finding new ways to do it. And they're, but man, they, if I wish they just could have seen what it was. I know. It's, it was uh, ridiculous. It's hard to say that, but on a good day now, it's still really good. I mean, I was down here maybe almost 40 years ago, and I saw a lot of great stuff oh, in the yeah. backcountry with Harry yeah. Spear. You know, yeah, we'd yeah. go all over right. the tournaments that I did. But it's really hard to think, like, would we do that? Would we want to get in as a young person right now, knowing what the future is going to look like? Not saying it's going to go away. It's just going to get harder, fewer fish, more people. So we have to, re, you know, enjoy those few shots or that those few fish that we catch, and we can't expect to get eighteen bites a day and catch nine. Right. No. Exactly. And the younger guys seem to seem to kind of know that, but they're good. I mean, you know, they they, they, know they get to, they know. get nineteen bites and catch twelve. <laughs> well here too is like if we fish Craig Key we might be getting more shots <laughs> yeah, that ain't gonna happen <laughs> that's funny Dude, since you brought up Craig yeah, Key yeah I knew that come was on of course of course come on and I say that's not I'm just no kidding. but it's it's um, it's a good question and, and um, it's a valid question you say when I spoke to Flip last night he was saying that um Hank Brown had, um, you know, at the Man of War, he had his spot initially. Absolutely. And you have these spots that people like, you know, Fordyce likes his spot. The bowling yep. alley has those guys. When did, uh, well, first off, it's you and Mike Ellers. Tell me about your relationship with Mike. Oh, so Mike's, when I first, um, Mike and I just really hit it off when I first met him. We just, I met him down here. Um, we were having dinner one night in, in Ziggy's. And they um, and his him and his brothers and we were and I kind of got introduced to him, and I uh, knew about Mike and, uh, and what was uh, that that you knew about him? Uh, just that he was a good guy. Okay. And I can't really get into too really heavy. Too yeah, no worries. Mike, no, Mike, <laughs> okay. Mike was wonderful, and he yeah. was I respected him tremendously. And we, you know, and he was just starting. To fly. He ran a, 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 a big charter boat called a timeout. I mean, he was a great fisherman. I mean, he used to fish up and you know up in. in Long Island, he fished a lot, and I mean, he but he really wanted, and he was running a charter boat. He had a big, you know, charter boat. Bud Mary's mm -hmm. a timeout, and he really wanted to get into skiff fishing. He just wanted to, you know, move down to that. He thought it'd be more fun, and so he asked me to help him first. He he had his first fly charter like the next day, and so I gave him like a two minute fly casting lesson, <laughs> lent him a fly rod. And you know, it showed him, and he, I mean, showed him some leaders. And no, all respect to Mike, he's a great fisherman. For he's sure. just never done this, right? And so he, we became good friends. And and uh, he said the, the next day, the uh, guy was trying to help his wife fly cast. He goes, well, he goes, uh, well, here you're the guy, you're the expert. Here you come show her how to cast. He goes, oh yeah, <laughs> I've had a whole one day head start on her. <laughs> and I'm going back. I'm going back 30 years ago this you know sure. this, this story so it's you know so mike no he picked it up really quick and um he um no he no he was all over and he's got you know one of the best groups of clientele of anybody right but it was fun but that's how i first met him so how did craig key come to be when God, did you why are you keep talking about we, craig we, we, key? i don't want to no, talk but we about have this. to talk about it. when did you first no, we, no don't we're going to talk about other stuff <laughs> we're going to talk about everything <laughs> when did you first fish craig key <sighs> And uh, what did you see? I really, I'm, I can't answer that. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, no, no. no, it was good. It just made sense. And I don't know. I just jumped in there. But at that time, Rick Ruoff was the main guy. Yeah. Rick was. The, he was fishing yeah. there a lot. Oh, Rick. yeah. No, no, it was Rick's spot. You know, and I just, you know, fish kind of would get behind him if I could. And and then Rick would, then I'd maybe get out there before Rick and Rick would get irritated. And so Rick would end up getting there. And it just, but it, 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 it's not a bad place to be. It's not better than anywhere else, really. Right. I, mean, I mean, how good does that get? Yeah, you know? no, I mean, for that's sure. as good as it gets. Yeah. But Craig Key, just, but it just, a lot of people, um, Craig Key, you really need to pull it. I mean, you can anchor down on a real windy day, but 
and maybe I just it made more sense to me than some people, but it wasn't back then. The people weren't fishing it. I mean, they really weren't much. Right. Well, obviously, they call it confrontation point. Yeah. Well, can we just move on? <laughs> <laughs> what's the worst? So what's what's the worst so, confrontation you've had out how there? How about them myths? You no. Know, well, one of the saddest. Uh, no, God, this is tough. No, this is good though. I didn't see this coming. God, I didn't know we were going to talk about Craig Key. But it's okay. Yeah, no, it's it, okay. It, so no, anyway. But then they immediately banned Craig Key from tournaments, which. Was well, I think what that hysterical. was. But what that was, I think that they were concerned about maybe Brian Helms being able to fish it or, or Ford Ice being yeah. able to fish it and no one else can get in there. So they just said, let's just yeah. remove Craig Key from, yeah. from tournaments, which is fine. Yeah, I think yeah. that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and I don't know. If, I guess. I guess I, we didn't really do that. You know, we really did. If we were there, they just – Rob does not need to be a – No. Rob, very, Rob, yeah, for sure. You can go anywhere, you know. Yeah. And um, and uh, so anyway, but that was uh, – no, it's just a good spot, and hell, it's pretty crowded right now. There's yeah. a lot of people fishing. I mean, it's well, really nuts. And if I'm at Craig Key, then I'm not somewhere else. You, you're grandfathered in. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Got you. It. Thank <laughs> you. No, but I remember, I remember fishing there with Rob one time, and that was the first time I met you. Yeah. You know, you were right there, right, and I was sure. like, "Hey, John, how's it going?" Yeah. You're like, "Oh, hey, yeah. good, good cast, great cast." But I remember I was, I was there with you and Rob, and. My eyes got open. I was like, holy shit. That, that falling water and murky. Oh they <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen so many fish in my life. No, don't say that. No. Come on, man. Don't yeah. st- you, he's just, you're just joking, right? Yeah. No, there's, okay, it sucks stop there. It, it sucks stop out there. It. Uh, so how about them Mets? Well, you, <laughs> how about them dolphins? How about them dolphins? Well, you know, Steve Huff says about that, I don't blame you guys for doing what you did. Right. I blame everybody else for allowing you guys to do that. Yeah. Okay. That's but you got away with it. And yep. it's okay. I guess I don't know what we're not really doing anything. We're just there. Yeah. Yeah. But you move <laughs> you move people away. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's okay. Uh, well so um let me think. Okay, we talked so about So let's it go back. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> so let's go back, you know. So the chrono uh, the chronological order, you know, once you got out of you know, the early years with Flip and Little John. How did you end up purchasing the store in Fort Lauderdale? I um, was actually, at the time, I was um, working up in Virginia. I was working with a group. I was, a fl- I was flying. I was a pilot. And um, we, um, uh, we actually had a contract to, um, to go to basically Central and South America. We would go to a country, and we would bring a film crew in, and we would make a film that they, that they could use to promote family planning. And that's and we were actually pretty, and we had a pretty good deal. So I was flying a bunch back and forth from Virginia to Central and South America. We based out of Guatemala City, but we went as far down as Bolivia and Chile, you know. And so we, it was, and it was busy. And so I was my 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 dream was to become to fly commercially. I really worked hard at it, and I had, um, um, went to one of only two colleges that offered a flight training curriculum. Purdue was one and Southeastern State College was the other one. I went to Southeastern. And so I came out of college with not much time, but I was a double I. I was actually a commercial multi-instrument rated pilot and I was an instrument instructor, but I, you know, I had a couple hundred hours. So I needed, so I worked this outfit. I was building plenty of time. I mean, I was flying, we were flying a, a beautiful Beach 18, a G Model 18. And um, so I, was gonna, you know, and I, so I, I was knocking on doors. I was really working hard. This is what I, my dream was to do this. And I was trying hard to, to see if I was gonna be able to move from where I was at now into maybe the airline industry or a smaller airline, you know, and just work my way up. And man, I just realized that it's, um, that it was, it was tough. I had no jet time, zero jet time. I wasn't in the military. And the um, airlines back then, a lot of their pilots were furloughed. And they just, man, I was, I was, I was really discouraged, and I was tired. I was, it was a lot of. We were flying pretty hard, so I went into a shop in D.C. I, there was a Norvis shop there, and I said, God, this is cool. You know, I, I hadn't fly fish at this point, and I met Barry Serviante in there. It had a store called Angler's Art, and I fell in love with the shop, and I actually bought my first fly rod there, which was a kit. It was a gold eagle, Orvis gold eagle, nine foot for nine kit. And I built this thing, and um, and so I really got, and I loved the store, and I really got into it. So I started thinking. I said, man, you know what? Um, this would work. I think in South Florida, because South Florida had no fly shops. Some of the 
shops carried a little bit of fly stuff. So I made a commitment, you know, and um, opened an orbit shop up in Fort Lauderdale. And, um, and that's really was opened up, you know, a lot of, so I basically switched careers and then I realized pretty quickly into it that I really didn't want to own He's an stuck in a shop. shop. No, in a You're shop. Boring. So, no, so I really. But I remember you had that. Yeah. And uh, as, yeah. we, as we reminisced, Sandy was the woman who ran she it was, and she was wonderful. She was fabulous. I used to no. buy, buy all kinds of stuff yeah. from your shop. So yeah. I, I, yeah, I paid my dues. Yeah, bro. no, it was a great store and it was fun and it was, but it was tough. You know, being in a retail sure. business, it takes all, you know a lot of commitment, a lot of work. So that's when I, I kind of started getting into thinking more about guiding. You know, about you know actually you know getting my captain's license and started fishing and and John Emery was one of the people that really um, uh, pers- pushed me into it, right. that really encouraged me, which I really appreciated, and uh, and flip. And Flip also later. Flip actually was in the banking business then, right? And he was starting to get. Um, and then he opened up a fly shop or a clothing fly shop in Miami. In, in Miami, down right. at, it called Wind River Rendezvous down in the in the um, in um, in the um, fall in the falls, I think. Or anyway, but and so and um, and I hel- I helped him because I was kind of getting out of it, and he. Um, and I, you know, I helped them any way I could, giving them some really cool guys that made cool stuff that I was selling a lot of. And so we got to know, I got to know Flip better when he had that shop and, and we had already met. No, I don't think we had. I think we, that first trip when I took him in the canoe was right in that period of time frame, right then. So, and then we just became, you know, we started running duck hunting charters together. You know, I bought my first, I realized I really needed an airboat. Well, I, you know, driving up today, I see an airboat you know, yeah. here on the runway yeah. uh, in your two yeah. Hell's Bays. <laughs> Tell me about your airboat. It's I a, mean, airboats no, have great stories. Well, there. Um, well, this airboat is actually Rob Fordyce's old boat. It's an old, it's an old um, hull that was built by. Um, oh, not Franny. Um, um, oh, jeez, I can't. I can't think. Anyway, he's a great airboat builder, and I got this. Um, Flip had it for a while, then I got it from Flip. And it's got a, a, you know, it's got it's got a 0550 Continental on it. It's a good, it's a great boat. It's it, an airboat opens up so much territory. It's it's like a it's almost an, if you love to hunt and fish, and you love Florida, it's just a tool. I mean, it it just lets you go places easily, you know, that you just can't get to. I mean, I mean, you literally couldn't get there any other way. And some of those places are really worthwhile being. I mean, you know, are they getting crowded as well, similar to the flats down here? I'd say a lot of the airboats um, you see today are are Sunday people just think having an airboat would be cool, and they're really not a problem. No, most of the airboat spots we go, we just don't see many people. You're still alone. Yeah, pretty much, and it really seriously still is like that. A lot of the airboaters are just, you know, but there's a lot of guys that you know that a lot of the airboaters are really more interested in, in ter- deer and turkey and hogs. Right. And which I I'm more interested in the ducks and the fishing. Oh, cool! You know, so I, so it's um in in my boat I can run that thing all day long on gr- dry ground that doesn't need water. So you <laughs> so know you can go jump pretty, over roads. You, and stuff. Oh yeah, you can go anywhere in it. So it's pretty neat. Um, if you don't mind, you're a pilot. You're trying to get in with the airlines. You can't get right. in. Tell me about that transition that you were uh, flying. You know, for the Green Bud. Yeah, you don't mind. No, no, I don't mind. <laughs> I mean, Flip no. tells me the story. He said, he, and, and I think it's it's a pretty funny story. Something about you ran out of gas. You landed on a road, and there was a gas station right there, and the truck was filling up the gas, and they came over and filled up your plane. A highway patrolman came over and wanted to find out what the hell was going on. But the windows are painted over, and you said, and he said, I need well, to take a look into that plane. And you said, No, no, you can't look into that plane. And he said, Why not? And you said, Well, it's it's filled with chickens, and chickens don't like light. <laughs> and he said, Turn around, you're arrested. Well, Is that true? Well, no, he's changed Something. a little. The, the, the story is definitely true. It was a DC three, and I had a good friend of mine approach me when I had to shop, and um, and uh, a really dear friend it goes back a long ways, and. He said, and he laid it out. I said, God, man, I don't know. I've, I've been flying, you know, a bunch. I said, no, I'm comfortable, but I don't know. Let me just, so I went down to MIA to the commercial part of Miami International, and um, they had a three. It was a pretty nice three. It was old. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, but it was in 
mechanically in good shape. And I'd always wanted to fly one. Christ, I'd never flown anything that big. So a guy checked me out, and I got checked out, and, and I said, God, this is pretty cool. I was looking out at this, you know, the wings. So I said, no, I can do this. I can fly this thing. And um, so basically, they laid it out. So I, you know, but the, the, it's kind of, the, that's all kind of true. I had a guy with me because it's hard to fly a trip, you know, by yourself. I yeah. first had to fly down to Columbia and meet these guys, and they had these two crazy sons that they they were going to drive me out to see where I was going to land this thing, because I needed to have a visual on it. Sure. I didn't have we didn't have GPSs back then, so it was like Mr. Toad's wild ride. I mean, it was <laughs> crazy. These guys were nutcases, and they were like chasing chickens through people's yards. I'm just in a pickup truck and going. And so anyway, I got to where we were going to land, and I got a good range. It was pretty easy. It was right on the coast, and uh, so I said, okay, I, yeah, no. So I said, no, I can do this. So I came home and and. Um, and uh, went, um, took the three and went down there. We got loaded, put about 5,000 pounds on it. And that's and, marijuana? Uh, yeah, or yeah, cocaine. Yeah. No, 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 no. Marijuana. Never, never did coke. Yeah, no, it was marijuana. And uh, all commercial grade stuff. And um, so um, I took off. We had to take off for me to land. I was Where I was landing was just outside of Apalachicola. So it was a pretty good trip. So we actually had to leave at night for me to get there first thing in the morning you know, to land this, we had it all figured. This is a long time ago, so, so um, this this is one of many trips. <laughs> so for this is the number one, and um, so I went to take off in plane. I hadn't flown it heavy, and we had probably five thousand on there, and I went to take off heavy, and they had smudge pots where the runway was, and it was a pretty good runway. It wasn't paved; it was dirt, but they had it packed it down, and and I was, you know, it, the plane felt different because of the weight, but I. And I lost the runway, man. It was gone. And so I was going off through this tundra. It was pretty low scrub brush and stuff, but it was a DC-3. And I said, geez. And it was- Are you knocking shrub off Oh, with the oh well, I, I, oh God, big time. But I, did, but I didn't know that because I'm trying to fly the airplane. So this is all happening. Yes, below right. me, but nothing that I could see because it was pitch dark. And I'd lost the smudge pot. So I was basically in the dark. My airspeed was getting right. I was real close- and I took off, you know, and I, so I totally was off the runway. So I pulled this, there's a, so I pulled the gear up and uh, flew. So we got to um, Carabelle. Actually, this is where this all happened. And the reason why I was getting low on gas, I wouldn't have been low on gas because the landing spot, the guy with me, Roy, um, he, he knew right where it was and I trusted him and it was pretty easy to find. Well, it was solid ground fog. You know, I mean, it was solid ground fog and I said oh my god you know we're and I'm out of gas I'm basically you know I need to land I mean there's no I mean I didn't run out of gas but it was going to happen very quickly and um and so um I landed at Carapel and um you know we landed and we were loaded and I so we actually went to get no we actually it, nobody was bothering us it was kind of quiet things were quiet so you landed on a road or no no it landed no no it landed at Carabell airport okay no it landed at no i know it right where it landed man i landed at Carabell airport and um pulled over and there's things were looking okay and i said so, so we actually went and called up the gas place we didn't you know we we walked over to where the the terminal was it was just it's a small fbo it wasn't right. a very big airport and so they were sending a Gulf. I was going to put car gas in it. They didn't have av gas available, but the thing will run a car gas at least long enough for me to get to the ten minutes I needed to get to where when the ground fog lifted. So, right. so the the car the the truck was coming to fill us up, and um and the, it was the Marine Patrol. The Marine Patrol saw this DC three and just came over and said, "Guys, what is going on here? You know what is it? What's the DC three? And you know what this what's happening?" And um. And I thought I thought the three I was flying, I didn't think it had windows because um, they had a cargo threes that didn't have windows. I can't remember. This is a long time ago, but anyway, we uh, uh, the guy with me, Roy, who wasn't a pilot, um, uh, he told him he told him that we had chickens on the plane. I said chickens. I said, my God, where do you come up with chickens for Christ's sakes? So that's funny though. What Flip said was. <laughs> Pretty funny, but I, I don't remember that. No, Roy, Roy said chickens, and I said chickens. And I said we are so in jail, man. So you know, <laughs> so basically we went to jail. You know, they got us. You know, we, um, for how long? I was in there for maybe a week, a little over a week, and I don't know what happened. Um, it um, it kind of went away. They, 
I had a big pretrial investigation. I had we had a good attorney, and and um, it just you know they kind of withheld adjudication of guilt. I kind of it walked. Yeah. It was nice. Yeah. I don't know what happened. I'm not going to speculate. But yeah, and that was the that was the first trip. Number of, one, one, yeah, of a bunch of a bunch of, yeah, of, yeah, of, 50. of more. Of 50, no, no, yeah. no. <laughs> The bunch, but, but but they all worked pretty good it, after that. Is so. it true that you crashed a plane and Flip came and saved you? No, no, I don't remember that. I did crash a plane, but it wasn't. Flip didn't what, come. What, no, tell me about the crash. No, Flip would be there in any circumstances. I right. mean, he would be there in a heartbeat. But I know who exactly you saved me, and it, and it was not. We won't mention his name, no, but tell me no, about that. What well, we were I had a Queen Air, and we were landing out. Out in a big farm in a field that was a good tight, you know, it was a good field to land on. I looked at it, and um, and the guys were late getting there to put out the silos. We were landing at night, and they were uh, going to put out silos, you know. And they, I don't know what they were thinking. It's just what they did. They put the silos out on the narrow part of a rectangle instead of the long part of a rectangle. Oh. They threw the silos out on the short part. Well, I hit the ground. I mean, I went through the irrigation dish probably going 60 knots, you know, 50, 60 knots, and just ripped the landing gear off, you know. And engines got tucked in, and we basically crashed. And, what was uh, going through your mind at that time? Well, not much. When you see that, I didn't know. I was. I thought I was landing on the long way of it, so I was okay. feeling pretty good. Then all of a sudden you look up, and you're going that fast, and you see a ditch come, and it's pretty much by the time you have time to think, it's pretty much over. Yeah. Yeah, so we were fine. We walked away from it, but plane nosed in, and and they got it unloaded. They got it unloaded, and it, it, the plane was totaled. They got us out of there, you know. So we were right. gone. So, but but that was, you know, but it was just there's something. Um, there was a time in the keys at the, at the, these times. There's a time in the keys where if you could, if you could drive a boat, if you could run a boat, drive a boat from point A to point B, and you're smart. You could get ahead. If you could fly an airplane from point A to point B and, you know, you knew how to fly, if you could drive a van from the Keys to the University of Florida or Florida State and not get pulled over, you know, there was a period of five or six years where, I mean, you were working. There was a lot of people down here that were working, and it's all very private, and everybody did, had their own little thing. But, I mean, there was a period there where it, you could do this, you know, I mean, where it wasn't, you know, we were, we were just uh, – but uh, that – period ended right fairly quickly but when we were there it was you know if you knew what the hell you were doing and you did it you could pull this off you what, know? Was, what was the time period probably 70s uh, mid, late 70s i'm gonna just say 70s to 80s before they you know it um before people before they really could you know consistently buckle down buckle down and, and, yeah. and make it hard on you. Yeah. And, and most we, of your flights, you would you would kick barrels off, yeah, correct? You yeah, wouldn't most land of, with it. No, most of the stuff we did was kicking. We, we you know, actually kick in the Bahamas. And, and, in the, and in the, the water? Boat, pick in, up in the, the water, yeah. We kicked, to the, over. we kicked to the boats, and then they, they could spread out and bring them back. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, so so the, no. the TV series, Bloodline, did you see any of that? I did not, and I, just I, wanted, I want to see it. I, I think it was pretty relevant to what was going on. Oh, I'm sure it was. I didn't see the movie. I, I really right. didn't. I, I, I want to see it, but I did not see it. So, um, but I, I, but I, I think so. There was, it, that was probably based on, on, on what was happening. Um, right. We had, we were flying. It's funny. We were flying down. We were going to Jamaica. And we had a, we were off Guantanamo, which is you have to be. You know, you got to go down around. We usually stay at Long Island, you know, and then we get a call and say go. So we just fly out and then go into Jamaica. And, and so we had this thing of as a thing of Rodney Dangerfield with one of those hands that go back and forth. You know, <laughs> when you're moving, and we had that stuck in the window just to crack the guys up that were going to load us and stuff. It's pretty funny. And I look over and there's a AWACS right on my wingtip i mean and this was in a 206 i was in a cessna and um this awax is right and they had to crack up i mean we had and this was going down so we weren't loaded we were empty but there's this thing roddy danger filled his hand going back and forth <laughs> and i said oh my god so we got loaded and we're flying back and i literally was on the deck all the way into haiti down into valleys of haiti coming Under, popping up just trying to stay on because they knew we were, they knew what was going on. They knew we right. were coming back. So most of your and trips then, were from Colombia to Bahamas. No, most of them were from Jamaica. Jamaica, yeah, Bahamas. A handful from Colombia, yeah, but mostly Jamaica. And then we climbed, then we'd climb in and we'd get to Long Island. 
or not Long Island to um, uh, uh, Great Inagua. We'd get to Great Inagua and then we'd just climb up to VFR level, you know, and then we'd try to blend in with VFR traffic. You know, we'd just basically try to blend in. So, How scary were those five years or so? Yeah, they were... It, they weren't that scary. It was. It was. You had to refine. I didn't. I didn't enjoy it. It wasn't something I liked, but um, it was working. Yeah. And uh, a lot of you know, there's a group, and we everybody's dependent on everybody else, and it was, that was it's my what you that, did that was my part. Yeah, it was yeah. my part, and it was, and it was, and we felt confident. You know, we didn't right. feel like we're oh god, I hope we don't get caught this time. We felt if we things work mechanically and if everything went right, that you know we You'd could do okay. it. Was, yeah. Was there any trips that went south and violence? No, in? never, no, never, never. We had a pretty no. The guys were great that we that we worked with, you know, and I, I think and that, I think that was really around the cocaine. It was and stuff. Yeah, yeah. We were pretty. You no, know, everybody we worked with was was pretty happy. Even if we lost a load, which we did lose a couple, you know, they were fine. I said, "Yeah, it's just part of business." Right. You know. Right. So no, we never ever had any kind of any kind of violence god what yeah. a time period yeah but it was a short period yeah yeah it was a period of you know four or five six years what a life you've you've led oh it's fun yeah, yeah. it was fun i mean you've had so many great friends and and yeah. fishing obviously in the yeah. outdoors with your airboat yep. um and i think flip said it best you were a child of the outdoors and you you did it well um well, it was sweet of you know, say that. Yeah, yeah all spectrums of it mm-hmm. um what generation do you miss most, if there is such one? God, I guess that generation. I, I guess that area right in the – when I first got my captain's license, it was pretty special. I got it in 1980. You know, I think that first 10, 15 years of guiding, it was pretty magical. Fishing um, was really fishing good. Fishing was crazy. We were really spread out. The fishing on Nine Mile, you know, there was a whole – I mean, Nine Mile was fished as good as anywhere – and all those guys you talk about, Greg Key. I mean, man, Hank Brown, he had his spot at Man of War. He sure. was there. Um, Billy or somebody who's, you knew who was going to be in the pocket at Sandy Key, and the fish would come down that system in the back every bit as good as the ocean. I mean, the, the ocean. I mean, Nine Mile, they'd come in herds. I mean, you'd right. and they'd see, all bite. Yeah, you'd see ter- 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 coming, and everybody was respectful. You know, they were pretty spread out, and there was wasn't that many guides really, and that was I. That was pretty crazy times. And then the ocean was really, I mean, there's Hank Brown, there's some guys that just didn't go to the ocean. I mean, they were in the back, you know, all that's all they went with. That's all you needed to be. It was yeah. that good. And it really truly was that good. I mean, there was, you know, um, I wish I could think of the names. I want to respect everybody so much. It was just, um, but, but a lot of the older guides you know really did demand respect and you know i was just getting started so i was super cautious right you know with everybody and i got help from a lot of those guys a few of them you know a few of them they weren't mean to me but a lot of them you know really wished i wasn't there but a lot of those guys really were helpful i mean very very sincerely helpful you know and um they appreciated how hard they always thought i pulled too much they always got on me say okay hey, come on calm man. down you're, you're making, making look me bad. look bad yeah. <laughs> yeah they said god just just anchor down and just fish quit pulling you're driving me nuts you know <laughs> and so it was it was a fun time i miss that time i miss those 80s yeah and 90s well you look a whole lot different without your beard you know so you're yeah, dynamic yeah. now do you feel yeah. like your face is a little faster through the uh the slipstream no <laughs> no i just i don't I, I you know it's funny i'll probably grow it again i i go i'll go with a beard for a few years and then no beard for a few years kind of goes karen likes it better without a beard yeah and so that's kind of where i'm at now and so, yeah, yeah. And, and so tell me about your schedule now you're you're 72 correct right and so you, you do fish louisiana still right oh yeah we're, we're in louisiana a couple months i fish there with mike ehlers and brian helms and we go down and, and rent that, a house and that's fun right it's magical no it's actually um where we stay there um it the people are there's nobody's got any money um, well, that's not true. Some of the oil rig guys are doing real well, but the commercial fishermen, it's, it's the happiest bunch of people I've ever seen, that part of Louisiana we're in. So it's just, it's just you feel like you're somewhere else. The fishing is ridiculous. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And so I mean, when do you go down there, September, you know, October? We go there in the fall, October, November, December. Yeah, usually o- mid-October through de- mid-December. And then you still go up to the Indian River or uh, you snipe hunt? I do, but that's just maybe, it's, it's down now to a very short time. 
Yeah, I mean, I've got one guy, one of two guys that I snipe and shad, I shad fish and snipe hunt for maybe three or four days. And then I've got a couple more, maybe for a week, you know, but I wish I did it more. But I've kind of, that part of it is I've kind of, because I'd rather be, we're up in Virginia now and our granddaughters are up there and Karen's up there pretty much because she's with, you know, her daughters, they're my stepdaughters. And um, and uh, so I'm, uh, I'd, I like to be more, with them, spend more time with them. So I try to come down as late as I can because I I'm, I'm just between Louisiana and the Keys. I'm just not with them as much as I'd like to be. Have you thought about retirement? I, I've thought about it. Um, I'm going to keep doing it as long as I'm co- having fun. And but I'm you know I, I'm getting probably close to maybe thinking about that. But I don't know what I do. You'd be you know? so bored. Yeah, with a life like you've had. Yeah, you know, no, yeah. it's been. I, I I enjoy the fishing. I feel physically good. If I physically can't do it. I'll, of course, I won't. But I, I feel, I feel like I'm, you know, I feel fine. I mean, look at Billy Knowles. Yeah. He's still out there at eighty. Oh God, yeah. No, I don't know if he's polling, but he's standing oh. there with a pole. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm no, sure no. He's polling. Yeah, no, Billy's <laughs> yeah. polling. Yeah, yeah I'm no, just kidding. He's, no, he's polling. We, we love Billy. <laughs> no, be, yeah, I um, you not. Well, the last question, and thank you so much for allowing us to, you know, come into your home and no, God, and, thank you. And tap into your life, which is so fascinating. I never thought I never thought I'd tap into it this deeply. So thank you for encouraging me because I, you know, but I really do mean that. I appreciate that. And it's, um, yeah, it's fun. Well, you, it's, got, you have a huge story that needs to be recorded and told and, and remembered, you know? I mean, it's, it's you, part of history, you're a Renaissance yeah. man in so many ways. So the last question I have for you who is, who's going to inherit Craig Key? No, God, there we go. <laughs> Well, I think that's a no-brainer, and I don't know. Can I Nikki say Mill. this? <laughs> Nikki Mill. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would certainly um, think about somebody very big. Yeah, and powerful. very intimidating and powerful. Yeah, yeah. with that, a sharp knife. With a sh- no, I would think. I would think. Um, no, I that God, that's that's that to say this on a podcast. Is <laughs> yeah, no, it's perfect. Yeah, I'd be looking at. Robbie, I think would probably. <laughs> Robbie owns it. Okay. I think Robbie well, I'll give it to Robbie. Might, I think he's going to protect there, it quite well. There might be a couple more people that might um, yeah, might get in there. But Well, John Donnell, you are a true pleasure to visit with and to know. You know, I've known you for a long time. We fished tournaments together, and uh, I'm so glad you gave us a chance to tell your story. No, thank you. This has been a real honor. I didn't see the Craig Key thing coming. Okay. That was a total surprise. Oh, well, so, I, I mean, I had to ask the question. So, uh, yeah, but I'm going to hear about this. You That's know okay. That. <laughs> Fuck, tell them to call me. <laughs> okay. All right. No, but no, guys, this is, uh, thank you for including me in this. I, I know the podcasts are really cool, and people love them, so thank you so much. Well, you're so deserving. John, I appreciate you. Oh, no, no, story, Nikki, yeah. no, no. You're, you're so welcome. No, thank you. So I'll try, Cheers. try to be nice. Cheers, John. Cheers, Cheers my yeah, friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> guys. John, thank you so much. Great wrong. What a so it's just a ride. What a so